Good evening and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. My name is Gary Gunderson and I'm the Supervisory Archivist here at the Ford Library. We are very pleased to have you with us here on this very crisp spring evening, first day of spring. So uh, before we get started, uh, I have a few housekeeping chores I need to tend to. Um, Michigan Media is filming our program for later broadcast on Ann Arbor Cable. So that means I need to ask you to please turn off all of your cell phones and other electronic items. Uh, when we get to the question and answer session, uh, please go to the microphone at the back of the auditorium in the center aisle to ask your question. We also have uh, books for sale, which our speaker will be signing after the program. Our program this evening is sponsored by the National Archives and Records Administration, of which we are a part, with additional support from the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. So that's the end of housekeeping chores. Uh, tonight we have the honor of hosting Hugh Howard, author of Houses of the Presidents, Childhood Homes, Family Dwellings, Private Escapes, and Grand Estates. Mr. Howard is a graduate of Tufts College. He is a full-time writer and historian who has written 12 books, or 12 other books, on architecture, art, and American history on such topics as the architecture of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington as an early patron of American art, James and Dolly Madison, and the War of 1812. Along with his books, Hugh Howard has published many articles on architectural history, music, sports, and academics in such publications as Smithsonian, House Beautiful, and Esquire. He is the founding editor of the Eastfield Record and has served as a writer, researcher, and scout for television specials broadcast on A&E. In Houses of the Presidents, Hugh Howard weaves together architectural history, intimate family stories, and presidential lore to shed light on how our chief executives live, ranging from the modest to the grandiose. In the process, he offers glimpses into our country's most essential historical moments. Tonight, our speaker will take us on a tour of the houses and everyday lives of America's presidents from George Washington to Ronald Reagan with fascinating and surprising stops along the way. Please join me in welcoming Hugh Howard to the Ford Presidential Library. Nice crowd. I want to tell you a story. It's titled, can everybody hear me, by the way? A little louder, okay. Its title is, By the Light of a Kerosene Lamp. Having been a mayor, governor, and president of the Massachusetts Senate, Calvin Coolidge was accustomed to setting the agenda. But as the nation's vice president, the social dinners, cabinet meetings, and as presiding officer of the Senate, he found his role to be little more than that of listener. After more than two years in Washington, Coolidge truly understood his office was without influence. With the Senate in recess and President Hoover on a two-month national train tour, Coolidge, along with his wife and their two teenage sons, were delighted when his father, Colonel John Coolidge, aged 78, admitted that he could use a little help on his farm in Vermont. So they all went to the tiny town of Plymouth Notch, population 29, <laughs> where the vice president had grown up. The sons would be put to work, and for the vice president, the prospect of three weeks back in Vermont offered a welcome respite from his Washington life. Wednesday, August 2nd, was a typical day. Coolidge helped a neighbor with the haying, driving a hay rake, much like the one that he had driven as a boy. Grace took her daily constitutional. Calvin also was captured by a press photographer in this image, doing his duty as a tree surgeon, mallet and chisel in hand, performing some surgery on a sugar maple. Shortly after 9 o'clock that evening, Mr. and Mrs. Coolidge went to bed, and the day was done. Thursday <coughs> proved 
a different day indeed. A few minutes after midnight, the vice president awoke to the tread of his father on the stair and his father's quavering voice. He brought shocking news. President Harding was dead of a heart attack in San Francisco. As Coolidge later remembered, I knelt down and asked God to bless the American people and give me the power to serve them. He and Grace dressed and descended to what is known today as the oath of office room, the sitting room in the farmhouse. He dictated a note of condolence to <laughs> Mrs. Hoover. Um, he started to write a quick statement for the press just as the first newspaperman appeared at the door accompanied by a local congressman. The word was out. John Coolidge, in the meantime, made his way to the only telephone in town, which was in the general store. Uh, and telephone Secretary of State Charles Evan Hughes, a former Justice of the Supreme Court, who was Secretary of State, and asked whether he, John Coolidge, could, we're getting a weird echo here, aren't we? If I move that away, can you still hear me? Because I have another microphone here. I think maybe that'll be better. Anyway, he asked uh, Hughes if uh, he might do a, conduct a presidential swearing in, and Hughes said that indeed he could. Now, there were no photographers there, but a scene unfolded that was evocative of rural America, the one that was already sliding into history. In the darkness, or the semi-darkness, I guess, the father recited the oath his face illuminated by a kerosene lamp on the table before him. President Coolidge repeated the words and added the closing, so help me God. Having been duly sworn in at 2.47 a.m., the 30th President of the United States went back to bed. <laughs> his time of vice presidential irrelevance had ended, and he would need all the sleep he could get in order to take on the tasks before him. On the day after the swearing-in, a member of the press asked John Coolidge Sr. a question. He was sitting on the porch of his farmhouse, and the question was, did he think his son was up to the task of being president? His answer was a masterpiece of Yankee understatement. I think he'll do fairly well, said Colonel John Coolidge. So, good evening. It's very nice to be here. My thanks to Gar for the kind words, to Kate for the invitation, to um, your various colleagues here, uh, uh, not the least of whom are Mark and Tim, who picked me up at the airport today and managed to get us here, although there was some doubt as to whether he knew the way. Um, and for everybody's good company at dinner, so thank you. Um, and thank all of you for uh, coming out uh, this uh, rather brisk evening. Uh, when I left my home in, uh, in the Hudson Valley this morning, I had six inches of snow on the ground, so you may be cold, but at least you don't have the big blanket of white stuff. Now, mostly for the next three quarters of an hour or so, I'm going to tell you stories, um, and they'll be accompanied by my collaborator, Roger Strauss's images. Uh, but I'd like to offer a couple of asides first, uh, not the least of which is taking on a book like this is humbling because, I mean, these men are giants. Um, yet too often history books have done to them what uh, Gutzon Borglum did to Mr. Jefferson, that is to say, turn them to stone um, and take from them not a little of their humanity. So my approach then is to look at presidents in their home, in their domestic circumstances, with an eye to humanizing them. By way of disclaimer, I should also insert here that in writing Houses of the Presidents, I have taken a, well, the political equivalent of a non-denominational approach to matters of party. Um, my aim is to offer perspectives on the men um, and a little bit on nation's history and not to serve a poli particular political agenda. I'd like to think, in fact, at the end, that you might not even know how I voted in the last election or the one before that. Uh, my larger hope is that what will emerge is an overarching theme, namely that people and their places are connected. More specifically, that his home sweet home 
has something to tell us about each president. I've come to believe, in short, that by looking at presidents in their places, we can learn about them. Now, Silent Cal is a case in point. Um, he was a child of the Vermont landscape, the product of a one-room schoolhouse. He did chores on the farm uh, from early boyhood. He was responsible for keeping the wood in the kitchen wood box stocked. Uh, he possessed a rural conservatism that informed his politics and his values, even though that's a term from our time. Uh, it's useful in thinking about Coolidge. They were shaped by his upbringing on an upland New England farm. He often acknowledged explicitly and implicitly his origins. Smooth-faced, mild-mannered, a man with a gift for listening, he was chary with words in conversation. But he drafted his own speeches, probably the last president to do that, and in his retirement he wrote an autobiography, one that offered many clues to the man and his presidency. Now, it wasn't that writing came easily to him. For him, it was a matter of good Yankee discipline. As he explained it, I always knew that there was some water in my well, but that I had to pump to get it. He talked like a Yankee, he acted like a Yankee, and in office he presided over his country like the cautious, considered, conservative man that John Coolidge had brought him up to be. Uh, enough about Coolidge. Um, in addition to a couple of stories, a couple of more stories, I'm going to offer you some of the gleanings harvested in the years invested and the thousands of miles um, traveled in preparing this book. Uh, I, I hope some will be amusing. Um, I hope some will be enlightening. Uh, some familiar, probably a few not. Writing a book like this is akin to making many new friends, to meeting the great and the mostly good um, some of them are well known, some of them not, uh, but some of these presidents are remembered by odd nicknames. So I'm going to give you a little quiz. Uh, this is the uh, audience participation part of the show, if you will. Um, and by way of warm up, uh, uh, let, let's call it the nickname game. Um, first of all, an easy one Who was known as His Excellency? George Washington, I heard that whispered in the front row. Excellent. Here's his house, Mount Vernon. He didn't like the name, His Excellency, by the way. Um, he didn't like being called President either. He liked to be called the General. That was his happiest moment in life, proudest moment in life, at least. Um, all right, now which President was referred to as His Accidency? Good nickname. Did I hear? Close. This man. Whoops. John Tyler. Uh, he was a Virginian. He was William Henry Harrison's running mate, thus the old slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, which was probably the first advertising slogan used in a presidential election in 1840. Uh, the two were elected. Uh, they were sworn in in March of 1841. A month later, Harrison died um, of pneumonia. Uh, and after learning of Harrison's death, death, Vice President Taylor made haste to the Capitol, where he took the oath of office and almost immediately issued a presidential inaugural address of his own. He willfully ignored those who didn't think he was legitimate. Um, when, uh, when mail arrived at the office that was addressed to acting President Tyler, he sent it back as, as recipient unknown <laughs> because he wasn't the acting president. He was the president in his estimation. <laughs> uh, and in doing so, uh, as he rose to the presidency as the first man to do so by non-electoral means, um, he set an important president precedent for the orderly transfer of power, one that has a little significance here in the Ford Library, I would have to say. Um, the 25th Amendment didn't come along for more than another century. Um, and in 1841, lots of people, because Tyler had a lot of enemies, not least because of his position on slavery, um, lots of them thought he was a blackguard with no legal right to the office. 
Um, in fact, no less a personage than Henry Clay, who in my estimation is one of the most interesting characters of 19th century American politics, um, referred to Tyler as Robin Hood, a reference, not, uh, not a positive reference in that, in that context. And so Tyler um, turned it around, um, thumbing his nose at Clay, and named his house Sherwood Forest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about his fraudulency? Another good nickname, huh? He was Rutherford B. Hayes, so termed by Democrats because they did not regard his election in 1876 as legitimate. The election wasn't determined initially by the uh, Electoral College, so they had to take it into the House of Representatives. And the only way they managed to do it was by promising to end Reconstruction to take the federal troops out of a couple of southern states, namely Louisiana and South Carolina, um, which in retrospect probably wasn't a good call, but uh, nevertheless, it got him the presidency. And he lived in this house, 31-room mansion called Spiegel Grove. It's in Fremont, Ohio. Um, and it's distinguished by, among other things, which links us to where we are tonight, by having the first presidential library. You know, Washington didn't leave a library. Jefferson's books got dis dispersed all over the place. Um, but uh, uh, his descendants, that is to say, um, the Hayes' descendants, established a library in this house. Um, now, one could go on. Um, Washington was also known as the chief to his secretaries, Hay and Lincoln. Hey, and Nicolay, Lincoln was known as the tycoon. But I am going to do one more nickname, that being the beloved sufferer. Does anyone know? In that case, I'm going to let you figure it out. <laughs> it's Armistice Day. The central figure in the tableau was supposed to be an anonymous casualty of World War I. The United States planned to inter an unknown soldier on November 11, 1921, the first celebration of that day, uh, just as the French and British had done the previous year. But the focus shifted when a former president unexpectedly stepped back into public view. A coffin on caissons departed the capital, pulled by six great <coughs> black horses. The mourners followed, led by President Warren G. Harding then, the long, solemn parade included cabinet secretaries and senators and Supreme Court justices. The Army Drum Corps set the cadence, and an open carriage followed. Everyone else was on foot, but special exception had been granted to the man in the carriage. Anyone got it yet? Did I hear Wilson? Excellent. He's His fragile health made it impossible for him to walk the length of Pennsylvania Avenue. So Wilson sat, bracing himself with his cane, his wife at his side, his trusted valet, Isaac Scott, riding in the front with the driver. Thousands of people crowded the sidewalks. There were whispers when the man in the pince nez and the unmistakable silk top hat came into view. Over the murmur, a call of greeting was heard as the procession continued along the route to the White House, a smattering of applause echoed. By the time the carriage stopped before the National Mansion, where Thomas Woodrow Wilson had lived for eight years, the voices swelled into cheers for the man whose vision and idealism the nation still held in high esteem. He was the man of the moment. His face severe, Wilson acknowledged the ovation, raising his tall silk hat with his good hand while the other sat immobile in his lap. With that, the driver of the carriage drove it out of the cortege and headed home to S Street. On reaching his quiet residential neighborhood a few minutes later, the former president found that another crowd awaited him. Wilson has disappeared into his three-story brick residence, but people continued to amass street side. According to reports in the New York World the next day, some 20,000 people jammed the street when several hours later, the front door opened and Wilson reemerged. He moved to address the crowd. He, he of course, was a practiced orator, 
Um, he'd uh, led his nation into war, given countless political speeches. He pled for speech, for, for peace. Um, but he could no longer rise to his previous rhetorical heights. With tears running down his cheeks, his voice quavering, he said his thanks simply. As the son and grandson of Presbyterian ministers, he offered a benediction. God bless you, he said to the crowd. With his wife Edith now at his side, he groped for her hand and, accompanied by Isaac Scott, they returned to the house. If it was a failed performance by his earlier standards, he gave the crowd what they wanted. As Collier's Magazine had it, the former president, physically crippled, mentally debilitated by a series of strokes, his party voted out of office, his pet project, the League of Nations, rejected. He had become, said Collier's, the man they cannot forget. He would live out his life in this house. So while we're here, let me give you a tour. This is the dining room. Odd spacing. Um, that lady over the mantel is Edith Bowling Wilson, the woman who would be president, according to some. Um, but that's another story for another day. Though the Wilsons entertained, Wilson himself never ate at this table, or rarely ate at this table with company. Um, his stroke had greatly impaired his ability to eat, and he had trouble preventing food from coming out the side of his mouth. His health was fragile, and his doctor was never far away, nor was his medical kit. Wilson worked at his desk in the library. There we go. Um, several planned books never came to pass. But this was also an entertainment space. A movie screen rolled down from behind that cornice. A graphoscope projector, which you can't see off to the right here, um, enabled the Wilsons to watch silent movies, Should which they did. The so we can see the light that would be a good idea. Can we do that? Anybody know how to do that? Great. Thank you. Um, so where were we? Now, I wish I could make a neat segue here to a rich story about the House Museum where Gerald Ford lived. But unfortunately, there isn't an historic Gerald Ford house um, that's open to the public, which all the houses in my book are. That's one of, the, one of the lines that we drew in selecting what to put in here. But I can show you this. <coughs> it's Gerald Ford's birthplace on Woolworth Avenue in Omaha, Nebraska. He lived here for 16 days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, after which his parents separated and he and his mother made their way to Michigan, where she would subsequently remarry. Uh, personally, I like the two-tone automobile out front. Um, and since we're in Michigan, home of the American automobile, can I get confirmation that that's a 55 Chevy? Yes. That looks like a 56. Could be a 56, okay. <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, so let's jump forward. Number 44. Um, I accumulated a certain amount of trivia in the process of putting this book together. Like, for example, they refer to this guy as the 44th president, but only 43 people have been president. I don't see any hands leaping up to explain that to me. <coughs> Grover Cleveland was elected twice. Unlike many others, he was elected to two non-consecutive terms, so he is known as the 22nd and the 24th president. Mystery solved. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Cleveland, this was his birthplace, um, time changes our expectations, what we think our public figures should do. And I really liked when I encountered this story. Um, Cleveland was running for attorney general in Erie County, New York. Um, and he and his opponent, early in his career, obviously, um, and he and his opponent agreed that they would limit themselves to four glasses of beer a night. And they did this for a few days, and then Cleveland said, it's too hard. I can't do it. So he went back to drinking as much beer as he wanted. <laughs> Times have changed, wouldn't you say? Um, a presidential site with a helicopter? Of course, it's Richard Nixon the Presidential Museum and Library in Yorba Linda, California. 
where there is Army One, which I think is alive in all of our memories, maybe especially so here. Um, because it really kind of amounts to a stage direction, as in enter stage right, Gerald Ford. Which president invented the lawyer joke? I give this guy the credit. If, he once said, if in your judgment you cannot be an honest lawyer, resolve to be honest without being a lawyer. <coughs> not exactly a joke, but Lincoln was capable of great wit, I thought. Uh, which president reside, re resolve, easy for me to say, relied most upon the telephone? It's actually a pretty easy one, and it's kind of amazing this guy didn't have a cauliflower ear. He was, needless to say, one of the great vote wranglers in congressional history, and he used the phone in his legislative days to urge fellow senators to vote his way. As president, this was taken during his presidential years, probably in 1965, a characteristic pose with the phone next to his ear. As one newspaper man said of him, Johnson made the phone an instrument of national policy. Of course, this was long before the cell phone age, uh, in which a billion or more of us, probably most of us in this room, if we were without our telephone, we would feel bereft. Um, Johnson had to rely on a telephone on his desk, but of course he had another one at bedside. He even kept one afloat in his pool on a specially made raft. Uh, to Lady Bird's never-ending irritation, he kept one beneath the table, mounted underneath the dining room table. You can't see it here, but do note that at the end of the table there is a desk chair, um, and immediately in front of it is where the telephone was located. Um, he also had a telephone in his living room, um, and in the days before the clicker and cable, he had three TVs so that he could watch what the three network, networks were saying about him in those rather difficult Vietnamese days. Uh, speaking of Lyndon, uh, he shared a trait common with lots of other presidents. presidents. Um, his mother was a very, very powerful present, presence in his life. Uh, in this dining room, Rebecca Baines Johnson drilled her son every morning before he left for school on spelling, arithmetic, the basics. Uh, her instruction was such that Lyndon actually knew his letters before turning two, recited Tennyson and Longfellow at three, and could read at four. Out there in the rugged Texas hill country, his mother trained her precocious elder child. He believed he could do anything and he would remember her as a constant, dogged, determined influence on my life. Other presidents with mother issues? Think Roosevelt, as in Sarah Delano Roosevelt. She had one child, Franklin. She almost died giving birth to him, overdose of chloroform. Um, she breastfed her child. She delegated relatively little of his care to the nurses uh, on staff in the house, which was very uncharacteristic for her time and particularly for a woman of her station and social status. He was privately tutored till age 14. And one result was that in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mind, Springwood, as his home is now, was the center of the world, as he put it. It would also be the center of his mother's world, by the way, because she would remain there until her death in 1941, only four years before Franklin died. And she effectively ran the house. Uh, in fact, even after uh, Franklin married Eleanor, when it came time to remodel the house, it was Sarah and, and Franklin who did the plan, who executed it, adding, among other things, this room a very handsome, very generous library room and a new stone wing to the house. Um, Roosevelt often worked here in a stamp collection. Um, he uh, played with his kids uh, here. Um, and sometimes it was the home of the much anticipated evening cocktail hour where the business of the day was quickly left behind and Roosevelt would regale his visitors with stories. Um, in fact, when the president welcomed King George VI and Queen Elizabeth in 1938. They did so with a tray of cocktails in this room. And Franklin confided in the king that his mother, Sarah was sitting right there, didn't approve of cocktails. 
Neither does my mother, replied the king, as he reached for a glass. <laughs> Mom comes up not only at Hyde Park, but a lot of other places. Richard Nixon, for one, remembered his mother as intensely private in her feelings and emotions. Hannah was said to be saintly, but she was physically as well as emotionally distant. Um, during Richard's childhood, his younger brother uh, had uh, uh, tuberculosis, um, the brother Arthur, and, uh, uh, and mother went off to Arizona for two years during his preschool years. Um, she breastfed another child when Richard was a child. Um, read into those facts what you will, and many have, needless to say, but the circumstances of his upbringing certainly played a role in making him the man that he became. Another interesting case, Bill Clinton. In a sense, he had two mothers. Uh, this is his mother's room, and as a wee baby, he slept in the bassinet. Uh, his mother was a single mother because his father was killed in an automobile crash when Bill was in utero. So uh, Virginia Cassidy Blythe had little choice but to go home. She arrived on her parents' doorstep with a baby in her arms, in effect. Uh, however, after a year or so of helping bring up her infant son, she decided she needed to establish a career for herself. So she went to New Orleans to gain skills as a nurse anesthetist, leaving Billy at home with her mother. Um, like Rebecca Johnson, Edith Cassidy, or Mama, as she was known, um, drilled young Bill on his numbers and his letters, and consistent with family lore, there are at the Clinton House today, um, there are uh, uh, post, uh, uh, cards, playing cards with numbers on them, uh, pinned, to the, uh, pinned to the curtains in the kitchen. Uh, he proved a capable pupil, highly intelligent man, one who learned to read at three and began to read the newspaper at six. Now, Mama was an indomitable maternal presence in his life. She established the highly regulated schedule of eating and playing and sleeping for Billy. In contrast, his mother, who married five times, well, Bill put it pretty well when he said, Mom lived a large, messy, sprawling life. Now, more than one psychobiographer has had a pretty good time with this relationship and his uh, uh, feeling about women and of various kinds. The house reinforces the picture. There's an interesting case of a presidential mother controlling not only her son's boyfriend, boyhood, but even the way those years were remembered after her son's death. A story. It's November 25th, 1963. It's a bright but brisk autumn day. A funeral procession, procession drew the attention of the nation and of the world and the images many of us remember are unforgettable. The riderless black horse, the folded flag, the boy in short pants, John F. Kennedy Jr. saluting his father in farewell. Yet for a few thousand <laughs> grieving Americans, those hours were spent on a suburban streetscape in the comfortable Boston suburb of Brookline. It was JFK's birthplace and within a few years the house had lost its Kennedy association. Um, he was four, Jack was, when his father sold the house and moved to a fancier house a couple of blocks away for he was making more money and the family was getting larger. Uh, but the Kennedy connection wasn't entirely forgotten and in 1962, during the young president's presidency, a plaque was put up in front of his birthplace here on Beale Street. Barely a year later, as echoes of the three shots fired at Dealey Plaza reverberated, the death of a president inspired talk of making the tall wood frame house, then privately owned and the residence of a widow and her son, into a place to commemorate John F. Kennedy. The Kennedy family soon thereafter took charge. A nephew bought the house for Rose, um, who then set about restoring the place as she remembered it. On the late president's birthday in 1969, the place was dedicated and gifted to the National Park Service by the Kennedy family. Now, the Kennedy birthplace is a wonderful case of what you might call populist preservation. 
Um, in a sense, the house, the public willed that this house become a national monument. And the visitor there still encounters the home along with Rose Kennedy. As you walk from room to room, there's a little buzzer on the barricades that keep you from going into the rooms. And when you push the button, the buzzer button, um, you hear a voice, and it's Rose's voice telling you about, oh, that's where Jackie had his porringer, and this is the kitchen, and it was always, it's, it's, it's a personal narrative that she assembled to tell the story of the house. Now, the story she tells offers a personal view of life, circa 1917, but Rose Kennedy's approach was less than all inclusive. Uh, she was, as we all know, a, a devoted Catholic, Catholicism, I think, was at the core of her personal identity. But when you walk around the house, there are no crucifixes and no Bibles. Uh, also, when you walk around the house and she talks about how busy the kitchen was, there's no mention that from the earliest days, they had two servants living in the attic. They had a maid of all work, and they had uh, a nursemaid who helped with the children. Uh, those omissions remind us, of course, that in the early 1960s, um, Catholicism was a political liability. Some quarters, maybe it still is, sad to say. Um, and also the Kennedy signs at that point were known in some quarters as being rich and spoiled. So they didn't really want to talk about that. But for me, the interesting bit here is that it really does demonstrate that the past is not a fixed destination. The Kennedy home on Beale Street remains unique and important, and in fact, as the National Park Service has increasingly taken charge of things, um, the story is now supplemented um, with a more encompassing view. Um, my time is clicking along here, and I haven't really done um, very much with the great early presidential homes of the Republic, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a tasting menu in the next few minutes. Um, we have to return to George, of course. Um, I find it illuminating that he was a doting father figure. Um, though he had no children of his own, um, he helped Martha raise her two children and then subsequently helped he and Martha raise her sons, two of her sons' children, pictured here, Wash and Nellie Custis. Um, he, in fact, purchased this harpsichord from London for Nellie, and even though it went off and lived in her elaborate home woodlawn after his death. Um, it was returned here and now is in the little parlor at Mount Vernon. A wonderful site for those of you who haven't been. If you're in the Washington vicinity, you owe it, yourself, owe it to yourselves to go and look. Um, just a quick glimpse of the Adams House in Quincy, Massachusetts, home to four generations of Adamses, not only John, but John Quincy, the sixth president. Um, the great historian Henry Adams, of course, was a member of this family. Um, he was a member of the fourth generation. Um, the third was Charles Francis Adams, who inherited not only the house, but by the time of his inheritance had become a 12,000 volume library and a priceless accumulation of presidential papers. In 1870, Charles Francis Adams built this library. He was also, by the way, a former congressman and minister to Britain, so he had some bona fides as well. It's a stone structure separate from the house, also on the property. As a Jeffersonian, I've written two books about Thomas Jefferson. I can't omit Monticello, needless to say. Some people's favorite house. Um, he's, th this house is revered around the world today as a World Heritage Site, and um, it's an extraordinary house worthy of the lecture unto itself. Um, but who could resist, here's the parlor, but who could resist the dining room? Um, it's just recently been repainted, um, what's called chrome yellow, of which it has been said, it's like looking at the world from the inside of an egg yolk. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson went up the road a few miles and helped his friend James Madison at Montpelier, um, adding this portico looks out over the Madison's 5,000 acre plantation. Montpelier, by the way, speaking of going on visits to places, if you are in central Virginia, one must go to Monticello. One should walk through the lawn at the University of Virginia, but about half an hour north is Montpelier, which has just been subject to a major 10-year restoration process. Um, and it's extraordinary and interesting and ongoing and a beautiful house. 
And if you go there, you also get to bump into this lady, Dolly Madison, one of the great interesting characters of our history. As Daniel Webster once said of her, she's the only permanent power in Washington. All others are transient. Now, to write of presidents has been a privilege. Um, uh, and as an historian of the revolutionary and early federal eras, I came to the task of writing houses of the presidents well acquainted with the homes of the first four presidents, for example. Um, they were men who, to reapply Dean Acheson's pregnant phrase, they were present at the creation. But in traveling further through time, I learned a great deal about other great men. In looking at some of these presidents in particular, I found myself adopting a paradoxical view of the great man theory of history. You know, in the last few decades, there's this sort of pushback to discredit the idea that history is about the interactions of a handful of white men. Uh, and by the way, I largely subscribe to that view, that, uh, uh, to the more inclusive view of the past because, in fact, I disliked history in high school and only came around to engaging with history in a serious way when I discovered that it also had something to do with women and with children and with servants and with art and with architecture, material culture, things that, that interested me. Um, that said, working on Houses of the Presidents has left me less sure that we should dismiss the great man theory of history altogether. I mean, think Washington. Selfless, infinitely admired, he was an anchor. I mean, would that Hamid Karzai had his integrity as he reinvents Afghanistan. Or Morsi, Egypt could use a headman like Washington, who had the political will of a Clydesdale. Morsi could use him to get his country out of the mire. Uh, think Lincoln and his remarkable instincts for negotiating differences. Two Lincoln homes stand out as essential and are included in the book. Uh, the only one he ever known, which is owned, which is in Springfield, Illinois. The other is in D.C. It's called the Soldier's Home. Uh, it's atop a hill. It's a place that the Lincolns spent warm weather months during Lincoln's pres presidency. Um, and Lincoln, a chronic insomniac, often walked the property. The first national cemetery was, in fact, on the same hilltop. Um, and he would be walking in the night where fresh graves were dug daily to bury the remains of the men that he had sent to war. I find that image of Lincoln both melancholy and poignant. Speaking of great presidents, how about FDR? He looms larger than life to many. Um, I put Jimmy Carter in this mix, too. Um, his and Rosalind's was the only home that I got to visit that's still inhabited by a president. Um, although he's long since gifted it to the National Park Service and it will become, after their deaths, uh, a museum. <laughs> uh, they lived in, have lived in Plains, Georgia, unassuming. Um, their house is unpretentious, full of books, full of paintings, paintings of his, by the way, furniture that he's made. Um, it's on a pretty plain street um, uh, in Plains, where, by the way, both of them have lived their whole lives, aside from times that they've gone off to the military and for public service and political duty. Um, and the house they live in today is not so far from the house that he grew up in, which is a historic site open to the public, run by the National Park Service. It's an open-air museum. Um, it includes the store where the denizens of the, the farm bought their um, staples. Um, it's about Carter, but it's also about Depression-era Georgia and what life was like during the Depression, um, where the races lived together and yet not quite. Uh, I think there's a greatness of heart about Carter, you know, the world-embracing problem solver that he's become uh, in his post-presidential life. Um, and just by way of aside, I think it's worth observing that the election Carter won in 1976, defeating Gerald Ford, of course, was a race that pitted two deeply committed career public servants, two certifiably good men. And I can think of no race since then where both candidates were so widely admired by, par by voters from both parties. Um, but an election can only have one winner, of course. 
In walking the timeline of American history, I visited Nashville and the home of Andrew Jackson, a fine antebellum mansion, uh, one built by the first self-made man to become president. Um, he built a statement house for himself and his beloved Rachel. The in interior of the house is very dramatic, um, and in a way, a reflection of Jackson himself. Um, the wallpaper, the decorative wallpaper, was made in France by the firm of Dufour, and it pictures the story of, thank you, Telemachus, um, son of Odysseus, a warrior like old Hickory with the yen to come home. Uh, in working on this book, I often stumbled across similarities between presidents. Um, I want you to consider one, namely, between Andrew Jackson and this man. Both were ruggedly good-looking, tall, men who moved west. Each possessed a genuine charisma, which contributed to a wide popularity with the majority of the electorate. On the other hand, each was intensely despised by a minority. Both men were avowedly anti-intellectual, as they relied upon several uncomplicated principles to negotiate the political waters of their times. But the key point I want to make is that both these men are better understood in their places. And my trip to Reagan's ranch north of Santa Barbara made that clear to me, as perhaps no other place did. He purchased a 688-acre ranch called Tip Top uh, as he prepared to ride off into the sunset. It was 1974. He was retiring from the governor's office in Sacramento. <clears throat> and after decades of public life as an athlete, a broadcaster, a star of B-movies, trade union executive, corporate spokesman, and of course chief executive of California, uh, he was ready to retire, or so he, so he said at the time. And I think Nancy actually believed him, but that's another interesting question. They'd seen this property a year earlier. Um, it's reached by taking a zigzag road that rises almost 2,400 feet above sea level. You get to the Granite Peaks and there's a dramatic view of the Pacific, but you don't stop there. You go down behind the slope and into a little upland canyon. As Reagan said as he got there on his first visit, I thought, well, maybe somebody's got a house up there they call a ranch, but it sure looks like goat country to me. Where would you ride a horse? The original house, which was built about 1898 by a Mexican immigrant named Jose Jesus Pico, who, by the way, paid $32 for the land, was sound, but it needed a new roof. The Reagans opened larger windows. Um, they laid a new tile floor. The old port space was uh, um, turned into uh, a spacious family room with a dining table, comfortable chairs, and this tall bookcase. Uh, and after his election to the presidency in 1980, <laughs> the ranch that he re renamed Rancho del Cielo became Reagan's refuge for his eight presidential years. <clears throat> he would spend almost a full year of his presidency at the ranch, and he liked it best when he could confide in his diary, things seem quiet on the presidential front. So far, I'm just a rancher. Now, Re Reagan was no policy wonk. He was a man of plain principles and simple appetites, and the House suggests that. Uh, enough stories, and time for me to bring this to an end. Uh, and I'd like to do so with a bow to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the presidents whose company, I imagine you've guessed, I really came to enjoy. Although I didn't find this quote of his until the book was almost finished. It seemed on finding it that FDI and I were very much on the same page when he established the Presidential Library in 1941. On the occasion of its dedication, he said, a nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past. It must believe in the future. It must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people to learn from the past so that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. Now, I brought to this project a mix of patriotism, curiosity, 
a desire to understand the men, because of course to date all of them sadly have been men, um, who became president. Um, I attempted in researching and writing Houses of the President and my compatriot Roger, who took all the photographs in, in, in shooting those images, to render onto the printed page evocative images and words and stories from moments in the president's lives. And for that matter, the lives of their wives and children. <laughs> and in some cases, their servants, their slaves, along with parents and others. Uh, I believe then that in our book, you will see something of the drama and the tumult of American public life. Now, if Gortzen Buglum did his thing big, I do it small. Stories like those I've told you. House calls, domestic glances at these men. That said, I'm confident that by visiting their most essential places, from the grandest to the most humble, we gain modern sights into the men who would be president. Thank you for listening. And uh, as promised, I would be happy to take some questions, and if possible, from the microphone. Um, if anyone. I'm not seeing a lot of hands here. I guess I told them everything they needed to know. Well. In that case, uh, if anyone does have questions that come to them after, I'm going to be out front and uh, I'd be happy to sign a book and answer a question. And again, thank you all for coming out this evening. Well, thank you, Hugh, for sharing this fascinating and entertaining part of American history with us and for the quiz, which I aced, and that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> As a token of our appreciation, we have a special gift to commemorate your visit to the Ford Library. Not one, but two, pen, not one, but two pens with President Ford's signature, which you can use to sign copies of your book after the program. Excellent. So thank you again Thank for you that. very much. And, and thank you to all of you for coming out. Before we adjourn, I have just one quick announcement. Our next program is Thursday, April 25th at 7.30 p.m. In honor of uh, Eddie Ford's birthday, which is on April 8th, Mary Ann um, Morelli, professor of government at Connecticut College, will present a talk on politics, policy, and power, the first lady in the modern presidency. Now we invite you to meet our speaker, Hugh Howard. Get your book signed and enjoy the reception. Thanks again for coming out. We appreciate it.